The philosophers therefore divided the life of all things into three distinct parts, growth, maturity and decay. Between the twilight of dawn and the twilight of evening is the high noon of resplendent glory. God the Father, the creator of the world, is symbolised by the dawn. His colour is blue because the sun rising in the morning is veiled in blue mist. God the Son, he, the illuminating one, sent to bear witness of his Father before the world, is the celestial globe at noonday, radiant and magnificent the maned lion of Judah, the golden-haired saviour of the world. Yellow is his colour and his power is without end. God, the Holy Ghost, is the sunset phase, when the orb of day, robed in flaming red, rests for a moment upon the horizon line and then vanishes into the darkness of the night to wandering the lower worlds and later rise again triumphant from the embrace of darkness. To the Egyptians, the sun was the symbol of immortality, for while it died each night, it rose again with each ensuing dawn. Not only has the sun this diurnal activity, but it also has its annual pilgrimage, during which time it passes successively through the twelve celestial houses of the heaven, remaining in each for thirty days. Added to these, it has a third path of travel, which is called the precession of the equinoxes in which it retrogrades around the zodiac through the twelve signs at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Concerning the annual passage of the sun through the twelve houses of the heaven, Robert Hewitt Brown, 32 degree, makes the following statement. The sun, as he pursued his way among these living creatures of the zodiac, was said in allegorical language, either to assume the nature of or to triumph over the sign he entered. The sun thus became a bull in Taurus, and was worshipped as such by the Egyptians under the name of Apis, and by the Assyrians as Bel, Baal or Bull. In Leo the sun became, became a lion slayer, Hercules, and an archer in Sagittarius. In Pisces, the fishes, he was a fish, Dagon or Vishnu, the fish god of the Philistines and Hindus. A careful analysis of the religious systems of pagandom uncovers much evidence of the fact that its priests served the solar energy and that their supreme deity was in every case this divine light personified. Godfrey Higgins, after 30 years of inquiry into the origin of religious beliefs, is of the opinion that all the gods of antiquity resolved themselves into the solar fire sometimes itself as God, or sometimes an emblem or Shekinah of that higher principle, known by the name of the creative being or God. The Egyptian priests in many of their ceremonies wore the skins of lions, which were symbols of the solar orb, owing to the fact that the sun is exalted, dignified and most fortunately placed in the constellation of Leo, which he rules and which was at one time the keystone of the celestial arch. Again, Hercules is the solar deity, for as this mighty hunter performed his twelve labours, so the sun, in traversing the twelve houses of the zodiacal band, performs during his pilgrimage twelve essential and benevolent labours for the human race and for nature in general. Hercules, like the Egyptian priests, wore the skin of a lion for a girdle. Samson, the Hebrew hero, as his name implies, is also a solar deity. His fight with the Nubian lion, his battles with the Philistines, who represent the powers of darkness, and his memorable feat of carrying off the gates of Gaza, all refer to aspects of solar activity. Many of the ancient peoples had more than one solar deity. In fact, all of the gods and goddesses were supposed to partake, in part at least, of the sun's effulgence. The golden ornaments used by the priestcraft of the various world religions are again a subtle reference to the solar energy, as are also the crowns of kings. In ancient times, crowns had a number of points extending outward like the rays of the sun, but modern conventionalism has, in many cases, either removed the points or else bent them inward, gathered them together and placed an orb or cross upon the point where they meet. Many of the ancient prophets, philosophers and dignitaries carried a scepter, 
the upper end of which bore a representation of the solar globe, surrounded by emanating rays. All the kingdoms of earth were but copies of the kingdoms of heaven, and the kingdoms of heaven were best symbolized by the solar kingdom, in which the sun was the supreme ruler, the planets his privy council, and all nature the subjects of his empire. Many deities have been associated with the sun. The Greeks believed that Apollo, Bacchus, Dionysus, Sabasius, Hercules, Jason, Ulysses, Zeus, Uranus, and Vulcan partook of either the visible or invisible attributes of the sun. The Norwegians regarded Balder the Beautiful as a solar deity, and Odin is often connected with the celestial orb, especially because of his one eye. Among the Egyptians, Osiris, Ra, Anubis, Hermes, and even the mysterious Ammon himself had points of resemblance with the solar disk. Isis was the mother of the sun, and even Typhon, the destroyer, was supposed to be a form of solar energy. The Egyptian sun myth finally centred around the presence of a mysterious deity called Serapis. The two Central American deities, uh, Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl, while often associated with the winds, were also undoubtedly solar gods. I'll just spell those two. The first is T E Z C A T L I P O C A, and the second is Q U E T Z A L C O A T L. In masonry, the sun has many symbols. One expression of the solar energy is Solomon, whose name, Sol Om On, is the name for the supreme light in three different languages. Hiram Abith, the Chiram or Hiram of the Chaldees, is also a solar deity, and the story of his attack and murder by the Rephians, with its solar interpretation, will be found in the chapter The Hiramic Legend. A striking example of the important part which the sun plays in the symbols and rituals of Freemasonry is given by George Oliver, D.D., in his Dictionary of Symbolical Masonry as follows. The sun rises in the east, and in the east is the place for the worshipful master. As the sun is the source of all light and warmth, so should the worshipful master enliven and warm the brethren to their work. Among the ancient Egyptians, the sun was a symbol of divine providence. End quote. The hierophants of the mysteries were adorned with many insignia emblematic of solar power. The sunbursts of gilt embroidery on the back of the vestments of the Catholic priesthood signified that the priest is also an emissary and representative of Sol Invictus. Okay, so I'm just going to take a short break to have another drink before we go on to Christianity and the sun. Would anyone like to comment? Yes, yeah, something that I know here that would be wise to point out is that the 12 signs of the zodiac are not all equivalent in the space that they take up in their area of the 360 degree circle. Mm, yes. Cancer is a much, much more inclusive, wider constellation. And Aquarius, what we're in now, is one of the thinnest, narrowest slivers. Mm. That's true. And uh, uh, allegedly, there are 13 zodiacal signs um, as well because of um, procession of the equinoxes, I think, that the Earth is now in a phase, or has been for some time, where there are actually 13 houses as well. So the old um, astronomy, according to this astrology, the dates are different, the 13 zodiacal houses. For example, I, I, most I, I astrologers I, don't even consider that a thing. I know. Well, that's understandable. It's dogma, isn't it? Um, if, if it's true. I mean, I know according to 
I am a Scorpio, but according to the new um, astrology, I am a Libra, which is, it resonates with me because I've always felt I had a lot of Libra qualities. Well, you have all qualities of the Zodiac because they all are part of your house system. That's so true. Technically, everyone experiences all signs just in different ways. Yeah. It's no wonder they see. worship the sun. Sorry, Lenny, go on. I have sometimes taken it that the 13th sign was the sum of all the 12 together, that the Zodiac as a whole represented the 13. It's also interesting to point out that in Pythagorean triangles, the 5, 12, 13 triangle is a right angle. And so the, there's a lot of interplay between 12 and 13 in the universe. And I like to think that any given number can always be taken with a limit of an error of plus or minus one. And so that in some ways, the characteristics of the 12 and the characteristics of a 13 are shared between the two numbers because of their existence next to each other interesting i was going to say that it's hardly surprising that humanity has worshipped the sun for so long because if they notice for example how as the sun moves through these houses you know a general personality type is born then it's no wonder because it does seem to me that astrology is accurate to some degree. I mean, not the astrology you find in the newspapers, because it's very broad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but when you get more detailed into it, it's incredibly accurate. And, and Voided, who's in chat here, has done for me my birth chart, and it was spot on in every way. Great. Voided, would you like to add anything to people's understanding of astronomy and the Zodiac while we're talking in this break? Hmm. Nah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, certainly, it's certainly interesting. And as I'm reading this, I because I have read Ralph Ellis's work, I am constantly reminded of what he postulates about who the real identity of um, the biblical family is and how, for example, um, the the person who he names as being Jesus, which is King Manu VI of Edessa, his mother was um, known as uh, Isis um, or personified Isis. And as uh, they, they all did back then, he claims, these... Um, Houses from these very good lineages, they took on aspects or uh, uh, claimed to be incarnations or reincarnations of aspects of these different deities. Interesting. I wonder if we can take aspects of deities on within ourselves right now and develop the powers that we need to change the reality of our own existence and other people's existences. Isn't that basically channeling? Channeling self? Yes. Channeling aspects of self? No, I mean aspects of um, like gods and stuff like that. Yes. If, but they could still be turned as aspects of self. If you believe, for example, or agree with the law of one, um, then on the assumption that these god-like consciousnesses do exist um, separate from, say, myself, uh, by channeling those aspects, I am still channeling aspects of self. Okay. Yeah. It so, doesn't matter, really. It's... it's it all works regardless of what you believe, whether it's parts of your subconscious or whether you believe it's godlike deities or even extraterrestrial deities or extraterrestrials. It's all aspects of self under the law of one, which is what Ra 
um, uh, promulgated, I believe, the law of one, is it not? I think it was Ra. Which, so that's the Egyptian theology as well. Okay, so I'll read on, unless anyone has anything else to add. Okay, Christianity and the sun. For reasons which they doubtless considered sufficient, those who chronicled the life and acts of Jesus found it advisable to metamorphose him into a solar deity. The historical Jesus was forgotten. Nearly all the salient incidents recorded in the four Gospels have their correlations in the movements, phases or functions of the heavenly bodies. Among other allegories borrowed by Christianity from pagan antiquity is the story of the beautiful blue-eyed sun god with his golden hair fall falling upon his shoulders, robed from head to foot in spotless white and carrying in his arms the Lamb of God, symbolic of the vernal equinox. This handsome youth is a composite of Apollo, Osiris, Orpheus, Mithras and Bacchus, for he has certain characteristics in common with each of these pagan deities. So I'm just going to stop there because I can talk about this a sec. In what I've, um, from Ralph Ellis's work, so this is um, what he also postulates, that uh, the character that the 